This presentation serves as an introduction to Galveston Bay. So let's start by zooming out. Here's a satellite image of Galveston Bay. It's actually the largest estuary in Texas and the second most productive bay fishery in the entire United States. It covers over 600 square miles of mostly brackish water, averaging about nine feet in depth. All right, so let's pause for a vocab moment. What's brackish water? It's a mixture that's part salt and part fresh water. So as figure 1-1 one, one above shows you, the body of water that we call Galveston Bay is actually a large bay system. So it has four larger bays, Galveston, Trinity, East and West, and then a lot of smaller bays. So Clear Lake, Dickinson, Chocolate, Moses Lake. These are just a few. In order to understand Galveston Bay, we need to get familiar with what a wetland is. So a wet wetland is an area um, that is often inundated. And inundated is just a really fancy word to say flooded. And this flooding can be permanent or it can be seasonal. So wetlands are swamps, they're marshes, they're bogs, they're fens, ecosystems similar to these. A really good way to think about wetlands is to break it down into the three H's. So the first one is hydrology. And this just means the presence of water and its patterns. So what time of year is the water present? How long is it present? And how many times in a given time period is it present? All right, the second one is hydric soils. So these are soils that have developed anaerobic conditions. And anaerobic just means without oxygen. And then the third is hydrophytes. And hydrophytes are plants that live in water. And that's really easy to, to uh, break down that word because hydro means water and then phyte means loving. Hydrophytes, unlike other plant species, are able to thrive in wet environments due to biological adaptations. So the wetlands we see today on the Texas coast are a product of water, wind, and time. To understand the present pattern of wetlands, we must go back about 60 to 100 million years ago. At this point in time, the edge of the continent was about where Dallas, Austin, and San Antonio are now. The entire region that would become the Texas coastal plain was then at the bottom of the newly opening Gulf of Mexico. Since then, the Gulf has continuously been filling in with sediment carried by rivers. These layers of gravel, sand, silt, and clay may be up to 400,000, I'm sorry, 40,000, big difference there, feet thick, and have extended the edge of the continent some 250 miles into the Gulf. This process of sediment deposition continues today as Texas rivers add their sediment loads to their bays or directly to the Gulf. So the Texas mainland shore, coastal plain, beaches, barrier islands, peninsulas, river deltas, bays, and estuaries are all products of the processes of erosion and deposition of waterborne um, or alluvial sediments. The Galveston Bay system is composed of a variety of habitats, ranging from open water areas to wetlands and upland grasses. The habitats support specific plant, fish, and wildlife species, and contribute to the tremendous diversity and overall abundance of bay life. So let's take a closer look into these habitats. And this is a map of some of the habitats we'll be examining more closely so you can get an idea of where they are. So we'll start off with Cypress Swamp. This is a forested wetland, um, and it includes woodlands or forested areas with saturated soils, um, that are inundated by water much of the year. In the Galveston Bay system, this community is located almost exclusively in the Trinity River Valley. The swamp community primarily consists of bald cypress with some cottonbush, water elm, and water hickory. All right, so freshwater marshes are adjacent to prairies and cannot support saltwater intrusion. So these are common near Sabine Lake by Port Arthur. 
they require large amounts of rainfall runoff to maintain the low salinity. Um, this habitat is really severely affected by drainage alterations upstream. Oyster reefs provide a solid base for plants and animals, including algae, mussels, barnacles, snails, worms, and sea anemones. Uh, and these creatures couldn't otherwise live on the soft bay bottom. Gobies, blennies, and other small fish shelter on the oyster reefs too. Oysters are food as well as shelter for some animals. So stone crabs and oyster drills prey on oysters and boring sponges weaken the oysters they live on by burrowing into their shells. Coastal prairies once spanned more than 9 million acres from southern Texas up along the Gulf of Mexico and into Louisiana. Today, less than 1% remains. So this loss of habitat, largely due to development, has devastated many wildlife populations that once thrived in the region. In 1995, the Nature Conservancy established it the 2,303 acre Texas City Prairie Preserve in order to restore and revitalize the coastal habitat and preserve the species that depend on it for survival. These preservation efforts safeguard important habitat for migratory and year-round populations of waterfowl, shorebirds, and wading birds. They also help native plants thrive, um, so big and little blue stem, yellow Indian grass, witchgrass, eastern gamma grass, you know, these can all be found at the Texas City Prairie Preserve. Artist Boat has also protected 690 acres of land. It's called the Coastal Heritage Preserve, and a portion of this land is actually coastal prairie. Salt marsh communities are found in high salinity areas along protected estuarian shorelines. So prevalent species in the salt marsh community include smooth cordgrass, saltwort, saltgrass, and glasswort. Smooth cordgrass, which is found in the intertidal zone, dominates the low salt marsh community. So this is the portion of the marsh that is most frequently inundated by bay waters. While living, cordgrass is seldom eaten, and then, if it is, only a few herbivores. Once dead, however, it provides nourishment to the large bay food web as detritus. So edges of the salt marsh serve as refuge and nursery habitat for juveniles of many species, especially brown and white shrimp. These habitats are also important feeding grounds for wading birds such as herons and egrets. At higher elevations, marsh hay and golf cord grass occur although they are more common in brackish mar marshes. A portion of Artist Boat's Coastal Heritage Preserve is also salt marsh. Seagrass beds. In the calm shallows of the coastal bays, seagrasses grow in large beds. Turtle grass, widgeon grass, shoal grass, and manatee grass from the core of form the core of these productive habitats. Migratory waterfowl feed on sea grasses and snails, small fish and young fish find food and shelter here. Now that we've learned about the different types of wetlands in Galveston Bay, let's understand their four main functions. So near shore coastal wetlands serve as important nurseries for fish, crab and other shellfish because the water is shallow, calm, and has great hiding spots. The total economic impact of commercial fishing at the wholesale level is more than 400 million annually. This employs about 30,000 coastal residents who are all dependent on the wetlands. The total economic impact of saltwater sport fishing in Texas is almost 2 billion annually, employing about 25,000 coastal residents. Wetlands are filters for water coming off the land. They reduce sediment and chemicals and runoff before it gets into the open water. So these chemicals and sediments could kill fish and amphibian eggs, smother bottom feeding wildlife and plants, and clog waterways. 
In wetlands, water flows slow, so suspended sediment drops out and settles to the wetland floor. Nutrients from manure, sewage systems, and other sources are absorbed for leaf and stem growth of plants. Others are trapped in the soil and used by microorganisms there. However, there are limits to how much and what kind of pollution wetlands can handle. Heavy metals and contaminated water are taken up by the plants and enter the food web of other species this way. The contaminated plants break down, releasing the heavy metals. Some wetland bacteria, however, can process some inorganic metals. And there's a really cool growing industry of bioremediation um, that's being developed from these wetland bacteria which eat the pollution. Vegetated wetlands along the shores of lakes and rivers can protect against erosion caused by waves along the shorelines during floods and storms. Wetland plants are important because they absorb a lot of the energy from the surface waters and they bind soil and deposited sediments in their dense root systems. So how dense are these root systems? Let's focus on smooth cord grass, for example. For one foot of grass above ground, there are three feet of roots beneath the ground. Wetlands flatness and lush plant growth slows down the flow of water when it rains. When this happens, water may gently trickle into nearby streams or seep into the aquifer, increasing the amount of groundwater. This ability of wetlands to recharge groundwater is especially important in times of drought and in arid parts of Texas where communities struggle to deal with declining water tables. The ability for wetlands to slow the flow of water also helps reduce damage caused by floods. When the water from heavy rains reaches wetlands, the water is slowed and the wetlands act like really big sponges. So they first absorb and hold the water and then they release it slowly back into the watershed. Unfortunately, humans can disrupt this natural flood control ability of wetlands by building levees along rivers, digging drainage ditches through wetlands, and channelizing streams. The unfortunate consequences of these actions increase damage from floods. Along the Texas coast, wetlands help protect shorelines and areas inland from flooding during huge storms such as hurricanes. So that was a lot of words. So let's watch this video to recap what we learned about the roles that wetlands play. Wetlands are very important to both people and animals. So what exactly is a wetland? Wetlands are places where the land and water meet. Some wetlands have standing water. Others may just be muddy places, but they all have special soils and plants that have adapted to living in water. And there are many types of wetlands in Texas, including prairie potholes, playa lakes in the panhandle, and tidally influenced coastal marshes. Wetlands are nature's water filters. Plants filter out pollutants as water flows across the wetlands or as it moves downward toward underground aquifers. Wetlands act like big sponges, soaking up floodwaters from storms and hurricanes. Without the wetlands, floods would destroy many more homes and communities. Wetland plants also hold soil in place. Without them, more soil would erode away, causing problems downstream for fish and marine life. Wetlands are important to wildlife as well, especially birds. Millions of birds must find food, water, and cover during their long migratory journeys each year. But as wetlands disappear, the birds are forced to live in smaller and smaller areas. Could our wetlands be a vanishing treasure? Texas has lost over half of the wetlands it had before settlement by the Europeans. About 7 million acres of wetlands are gone. Many were destroyed by being drained and filled with dirt to use for farming or as land on which to build our homes and businesses. This presents a huge challenge to a growing population that depends on a clean water supply. While state and federal conservation agencies and wildlife conservation organizations work to protect and restore wetlands, you can help too. Visit a wetland to enjoy bird watching, 
fishing, or even kayaking. We can all learn more by doing. Then you can share your knowledge with others so we can hold on to these Texas treasures for years to come. Now let's take a peek at the plant life inside Galveston Bay. So the plants and animals that can tolerate fluctuating salinities and temperatures are found permanently in the estuarian environment. However, as the salinities change, the diversity of species also changes. So flows of fresh water and low salinities lead to an increasing abundance of freshwater species. Low freshwater flows and high salinities lead to increased abundance of marine species. Right, so that makes sense. Um, low salinity, more freshwater species. Low freshwater, more marine species. The diversity resulting from salinity variation is characteristic of the physical and ecological diversity of an estuary. So could you imagine if your feet never ever got out to dry? Well, as silly as it sounds, that's what life is like for plants and wetlands whose roots are always underwater. That's why only certain kinds of plants can survive here. So the majority of the area's plants are grasses, sedges, rushes, and succulent plants such as saltwort and glasswort. This marsh habitat is an open system dominated by these lower plants. There really are, in fact, rarely any trees found. While these marshes are found along coastal areas, these saltwater habitats cannot survive in a place with lots of wave action. Rather, these areas are low energy locations because they receive um, tidal influence but lack the pounding surf found closer to the ocean and the gulf. So let's take a moment to highlight a few common species. Number one, saltwort. So this grows along as a vine or a small shrub. The plant has bright green curved leaves and a yellow or gray stem. Two, smooth cord grass is a tall grass that glows in clumps. Its leaves are long and stiff and the plant is found in the low marsh closest to the water. And number three, sea grasses are flowering plants that grow under the water. So here are where the various plants are found according to their location uh, and the water level of the marsh. So you can see that we have smooth cord grass on the far left over in the tidal flats. And then on the right hand of the diagram, we have salt matter cord grass in the high marsh. So now let's take a look at some of the wetland fauna. Some fish species spawn in the shallow marshy places along the shorelines of lakes and rivers. The small young fish hide from larger predators in the plant-filled shallow water wetlands. So there's plenty of food for young fish in such places. They remain in this cover until they grow large enough to venture out into deeper water. So without the wetlands, these species would disappear. So even though there's plenty of deep water nearby where the adult fish can live just fine, you need that place to nurture the young fish. So in fact, many freshwater fish, and most of the important fish and invertebrates in the Gulf of Mexico are really dependent on wetlands as a place for their young to feed and grow up safely. The Galveston Bay system is an important area for birds of all types. Bird watchers can sight many unique species during the migratory seasons in the area. While many of us only think of gulls around the bay, several endangered or threatened species have been sighted in the Bay Area. The habitats within Galveston Bay provide a place to rest, forage, and raise their young. The same marshes that are nurturing grounds for small marine life provide a food source for many of the coastal birds. There are way too many birds to list, but a few common ones are uh, one, gulls. So most are black and white. They're aggressive birds with really raucous calls and they feed by dipping from the water surface. Number two, pelicans. Those are really huge birds with pouch-like bills. Three, terns. They're black and white birds with black crests and forked tails. 
They're generally more graceful than gulls and they feed by diving. And four, cormorants. So these are dark, long-necked, short-tailed fishing birds. And you could say that they resemble a large black duck. Great, so looking at some of the mammal species. While often seen as a nuisance, skunks and raccoons play really important ecological roles. So raccoons play a role as a gardener. They distribute the plant seeds and so they feed on these berries and nuts, um, not just meat, and then they carry around these seeds. And um, after they digest them, you know, they're spreading the growth of the plants when they release their waste. All right, skunks are really beneficial. They're uh, omnivorous and they eat a variety of garden pests, including mice, voles, beater, beetles, some larvae, wasps, and crickets. So moving on to the invasive species. Um, there'll be a presentation completely on invasive species, but very quickly, an invasive species is something that's not native to the area and is causing harm. Um, so they can threaten the survival of native plants and animals, they can interfere with ecosystem functions, they can hybridize with native species resulting in a negative genetic impact, they can spread easily in today's area of global commerce, they can be difficult and costly to control, they can impede industries and threaten agriculture, they can be a significant drain on the economy, and they can even endanger human health. So if we look at the specific invasives affecting Galveston Bay, um, let's look at Chinese tallow. So since 1970, woodlands containing uh, these monocultures of the highly invasive Chinese tallow have increased. So it went from an area of five to 30,000 acres in Galveston County. The bay has many uses, so let's break it down. Galveston Bay provides 70% of oyster landings and 45% of the recreational catches in the state each year. Shrimping is a vital industry, as is recreational boating and fishing. Almost 5,000 ships annually pass through the bay to the port of Houston. 50% of all U.S. petrochemicals are produced along the shore of Galveston Bay. Not counting the jobs inside the refineries or the products sold there, Galveston Bay accounts for about $3 billion in direct and indirect economic benefit to the region each year. Family activities abound in and around the Bay. So cities, counties, the state, and federal governments all provide recreational areas for public enjoyment around Galveston Bay. And this map shows the location of those recreational areas. Galveston Bay is a fisher's paradise. The bay is home to many species and a full stringer is a common sight. In fact, 45% of the recreational landings in Texas come from Galveston Bay. There are more than 600,000 boats operating in Texas waters and then untold numbers of canoes, sailboats, rowboats, and other types of watercraft. You know, so ironically, it's attractiveness, all of these good things we just mentioned, uh, the very things that draw people to live, work, and play near or on the bay is ultimately its downfall. So the bay system is beginning to show the wear and tear of being surrounded by the fourth largest metropolitan area in the United States. We're seeing that seagrasses are disappearing, freshwater inflow is being reduced to provide more water to cities, and the over-harvesting of fisheries threatens entire species found in the bay and the gulf. However, if we treat it with respect, it won't disappear.